can I have a small request real quick? Sure. Aaron, can I be a, a total dork and uh, take a picture with you real quick? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> All right, let me get you up here, Dana. There you go. I, I, <laughs> I feel like I got to take advantage of bragging about meeting you. Of course. <laughs> I, I, mean, I got dusted on the picture. I'm, going, on, then. I'm, I'm jumping in if that's all right, Aaron. Yeah. We're very much <laughs> this like is, yeah. This is su- to be honest, I've never done this. This is super cool. We're very much <laughs> the paparazzi of the design world. <laughs> it's a <laughs> selfie, isn't it? <laughs> I'm digging it. Welcome to the Honest Designers Show, your transparent look into life as a modern designer. My name's Tom Ross and I'm the founder at designcuts.com and this week I'm joined by my fellow Brit and hand lettering expert Ian Barnard, American retro design expert Dustin Lee and the incredibly talented South African illustrator Lisa Glanz. In this week's episode, we're incredibly excited to welcome world-renowned animator and digital artist Aaron Blaze to the show. I'll introduce Aaron properly in a second, but suffice to say, he's one of our most fascinating guests ever, and all of us had an absolute blast recording this episode with him. There was just so much to learn from Aaron that myself and my co-hosts came away from this episode feeling incredibly inspired, and we really hope you feel the same. So without further ado, let's get into the show. So today I'm thrilled to be joined by Aaron Blaze, who's an incredible animator, director and artist who has honestly one of the most interesting careers I think I've ever seen. He also shows what seems to be a limitless passion for his craft and his personal inspiration to me and my co-host in terms of doing something that you truly love. He's worked as an animator and supervising animator for some huge Disney productions, including The Lion King, Aladdin, Beauty and the Beast, Mulan, and many more. He's even directed his own Disney feature film, Brother Bear, which I think grossed over 250 million worldwide, which is crazy. Congratulations, Aaron. And these (laughs) days, Aaron spends his time running Creature Art Teacher, where he's inspiring and teaching aspiring young artists every single day through his video courses and his incredible social media content. So first of all, Aaron, a huge thank you for joining us on the show. It's an honor. Thank you. It's an honor for me. I am really excited to uh, to talk to you guys today. This is going to be amazing. Yeah, me too. I'm pumped. Yes. So first of all, I believe you've just got back from China. Is that right? Yeah, I was actually in China, Singapore, uh, Myanmar, and South Korea. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Over. Yeah, over. Uh, I was there for a month. So 25 days, sure. close to a month. Okay. And I saw you were actually teaching local kids animation and, and that kind of thing. Was it kind of a work trip or a vacation or a bit of both? No, it was a work trip. It was actually, uh, I was doing it for uh, Dulwich College, which is there in the UK. And they have campuses all throughout Asia, international schools. And so they have a, an arts enrichment program where they bring people in in different disciplines. And uh, so they hired me to come and talk to kids all the way from age four all the way up to uh, wow. 18. And uh, and I hit all the campuses throughout Asia. And I talked to them about design, uh, animation, painting, all kinds of stuff. It was great. It was really great. That's amazing. And how'd it go down with them? It went, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it was, it was incredible, first of all. And, uh, and maybe I, maybe it's just cause I'm used to like, how schools are here in the States, but I, I, I've never met such an amazingly polite, appreciative, well-behaved. I mean, all the the good adjectives you can imagine. Uh, I've never met that many kids. And you know, I, I taught thousands of kids over that trip. I never had one single kid act up, get out of line. Everyone was interested. They were engaged. It was it was one of the most pleasurable experiences I've had teaching. As it should be, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was incredible. And no language barrier? I mean, how, how did that no, Actually, it was, it was the complete opposite. Um, really? It was... It actually was very strange. First of all, the Dulwich schools are 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 the are UK based, so a uh-huh. lot of the teachers there are from the UK. Um, all the kids are 
they're very international. Um, in China, it's mostly Chinese, but then there's a lot of, you know, there's a mix of other kids internationally. But what was interesting, and I was I was puzzled by, was that a lot of the kids had a perfect, and I mean perfect American accent, yeah, oh, wow. speaking English. And I asked them, I said, well, why are why do they have an American accent? And they said they all watch TV. <laughs> that's, <what laughs> I hear them say. that's exactly what it was. Yeah, I was blown away. They said, "Yeah, they watch a lot of Friends." <laughs> <laughs> they probably had like every catchphrase down as well, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it blew my mind. I was talking to some, it, it, I mean, perfect. I thought a couple of the kids. I thought they were from the states, and they'd never been there. <laughs> that's so good. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I can see through that and various other things you've done and your main business now, you clearly have a real passion for teaching others. And I think that, I that's really inspiring. And I think actually a real cornerstone of the creative community. But on the other side of that, what would you say are some of the best ways to learn, do you think? Because you've kind of gone right from the student to the teacher. And I know yes. we're, we're always learning, but have you got any particular tips for people looking to soak this stuff up? You know, I'm, my biggest thing is, from an artistic standpoint, I've learned, there's two places where I, I've, I think I've learned the most from. One is directly from nature. Nature, to me, has always been the best teacher, um, whether it's lighting, you know, because I'm, I'm a representational artist when it comes to art, so I don't do a lot of, well, but even if I'm doing uh, uh, abstract type work, I'm still pulling inspiration from nature. So a lot of my inspiration, a lot of my learning is from there. And then the rest of my learning is from other people. I love interacting with other people. I love in, uh, um, hearing other people's ideas, seeing other people's talents, um, seeing what other people can do that I can't do so that I can be inspired and, and try what they're doing. Um, it's, it's those two things that I think... Uh, you know, combined really can elevate your game. I was really lucky in the fact, you know, over the 21 years that I was at Disney, I worked with some of the best artists in the world. And so did you have mentors? Together, I did. Uh, I did have mentors. And through those mentors and through just the association and friendship of other people that I had there, all of us elevated our game because we were rubbing off on one another. Mm. One of my greatest mentors and he's the guy that actually taught me animation when I first started. Uh, his name is Glenn Keane. And he is he just won the Oscar, actually, for Best Animated Short with Kobe Bryant uh, for a short called Deer Basketball uh, this year. Um, and uh, he he's a supervising animator of, of Ariel from The Little Mermaid and Beast from Beauty and the Beast and Tarzan and all these great characters. And uh, But he came at it from... Uh, from a standpoint that I did, I mean, he came at it, you know, from, he was an illustrator and a painter first, and then he got into animation. And that's, that's how I, that's what I was. I was an illustrator first. And, uh, I came in a, at the age of 20 and he took me under his wing and, uh, he showed me what could be done in animation, you know, the, the acting, the music, the, the drawing, the painting, the, you know, everything, all the expression. And it just blew my mind. And, and, you know, he's the guy that kind of lit that fire in me. Oh, and, wow. I, I just looked him up and he's the son of um, Bill, Keen. Bill Keen, who created Family Circus. Exactly. Exactly. He's one of the kids in Family Circus. <laughs> <laughs> That's wild. <laughs> yeah, I know it is, isn't it? Yeah. Roots. That's crazy. Nice. So, Aaron, would you say your learning has been on quite a linear path? Because we've talked about this a lot on the show, right? It's Yeah the case of showing up every day we've um, encouraged a lot of people to start daily challenges where they mm -hmm. put out a, a bit of work on social media every single day not only to tune their creativity and, and practice but to put it out to the world and have that accountability so yeah. has it kind of worked like that for you over many years of just showing up every day and getting better or have there been a few moments where you've felt that inflection point of just suddenly you know getting twice as good almost in, in a period of weeks or something like that it's not an even graph like this at all. I mean, it doesn't go up at a 45 degree angle just perfectly and everything's awesome. Um, it, it's a combination of both of what you just said. I mean, I think there's there's periods of steadily, you steadily get better, then you level off and you plateau for a while and you might get a little stale and all of a sudden, I, whether something's, the, the stars align and your life is just right or something. All of a sudden, I, I have had experiences where I've just <clears throat> just rocketed up because I made this huge discovery. Um, those are few and far between. They don't happen very often. <laughs> Does anything spring <laughs> to mind in terms of what might have caused those? 
one of the big ones was was just the advent of new technology that enabled me to try different things that I'd never thought of before. So when I when I went from the traditional world into the digital world, when I started working in Photoshop, um, you know, working on a Cintiq Wacom Cintiq tablet pen display, uh, where I could you know I could draw and paint right on the screen, but I was using Photoshop. All of a sudden, anything I, things that I had never thought of before, I was doing and and. Um, uh, there was a point where I, you know, because I was working digitally, I was able to mix photography because I loved, I love photography as well. I was mixing photography with my paintings and creating images and environments and worlds that I'd never, I'd never created before. And that was, that was huge for me. And, uh, uh, it, you know, it's, it's that sort of thing. A lot of times it's an outside influence that will come in unexpectedly. And all of a sudden you're doing things that you never thought of before. So do you think that whole transition from traditional to um, digital actually changed your style or do you think it refined your style? I think it brought, I think it broadened my style. Oh, uh, okay. I'm, yeah, because I'm personally finding that difficult at the moment. Like I'm yeah. fighting that. Yeah. Don't fight it. I, I, I try, I roll with it. It's, it's, that's my recommendation. I, yeah. I, um, I'm one that loves experimentation and I'm not, even though I probably have a style, I've never, I get that question a lot, you know, how do I find a style? And, um, I don't think a style is something you look for. It's just something that evolves. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. um, and so, which means I think my work is constantly the look of my work, the way I think, I mean, I think our style is a reflection of ourselves. And so I'm constantly evolving as a person. And so therefore my style should as well. And, yeah. and, 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 I love the idea of new technology and new ways of expression and new ways of creating visual, uh, visual expression. And so, um, along with that, you know, it's, it's going to expand your mind. It's going to expand your, your expression. So it's, yeah. I think it's kind of cool. Aaron, can I, can I ask him? So I'm, I'm new to illustrate and I just like did a hundred day challenge to get better. Cause I hadn't drawn since I was a teenager Sure. and I'm, I'm looking at your, creature art teacher site and it's intimidating. I mean, the, the work is so good. So do you have any tips for someone who's in a position like me where they're just starting and they feel like they're nowhere near that right. to, to, I guess, keep the momentum up. I feel like sometimes it can get like discouraging when you see people that are so, so far ahead of you. You've said a couple of key things in your question that I think you need to avoid. Um, you, you were looking at, you got to remember I'm 50 years old and I've been doing it for, I always tell people I started drawing when the Beatles were still a band and, and <laughs> Hendrix was still playing guitar. <laughs> I did. And uh, uh, so you got to realize I've got 48 years under my belt of drawing and painting. So when you said being intimidated, I don't think you don't be intimidated. Um, I think you should take it and, uh, you know, instead of comparing, get out there and you got to, it's, you know, every journey starts with that first step. That's an old cliche, but it, it really applies to everything. And as long as you're drawing, painting, doing something, I don't care if you're doodling, as long as you're doing it as often as you can, and you're doing it from life, I think that's where you're going to learn a lot, uh, especially mm. for people that are first starting out. I really, I really recommend to them a lot Drawing from your mind is okay, but go out and draw from life. Look at people, look at nature, because those are the places where that's where you're going to make discoveries and that's going to burn its way into your visual library. I always talk about the visual library being this thing that you build over a course of a lifetime. And an example I always give is if you put a piece of paper in front of a five-year-old and tell them to draw a tree, They'll draw, you know, two bent little lines with a big squiggly afro on top, right? And that, mm. that's a tree. <laughs> but then if you can take that same kid and you take them outside and you sit them down in a chair and you put them in front of a tree and say, draw that tree, look at the texture, look at the branches, look at the leaves. They may not draw it really well, but it's going to be completely different. They're going to be creating something from observation. And that observation, when I, I don't know what it is that happens in our brain, but I, I know that when I sit down and I'm observing for to, to draw, it's burning itself even more into my brain mm. so that later on I can, I can recall that. And now when I draw a tree sitting in my studio, I'm drawing it from a different point of view. 
And yeah. so if you can do that on a regular basis, because I still go out and I still try to draw from life as often as I can, you're going to start making these discoveries that will burn themselves into your brain and it will elevate your work. Hmm. Thank it's, you. It's really interesting that. you said that about the tree because it's taken me back to college uh, and I was doing art at college and loved it. And yeah. my teacher would always try and push us outside of our comfort zone. And he made us draw a tree and then draw it again, but with our eyes shut. So oh, he was testing how much it had kind of burned into our memory and how we would get the form down when we weren't yeah. worried about all the other stuff and maybe so much the texture. It was just trying to capture its essence yeah. of, of what's in your mind. That's great. That's very cool. I guess that's kind of, it's very similar to what I was just talking about. He was mm. also the teacher who whited over with paint a piece I did, which I was really proud of because he was like, you're not pushing <laughs> yourself enough. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's like, start again. So, so it, it, it was kind of like too. carrot and stick. Um, <laughs> so, so Aaron, this is purely out of me being uh, nosy, but I'm sure the listeners would love to hear as well. And I don't know what you can share legally and so on, but sure. I would love to know what a day inside working for Disney looks like because yeah. we all see the wonderful output of the movies and the animations, but I have no mm. idea what it looks like behind the scenes. It's, it's, it's the most fun you could have at a job. And it's one of the hardest things you can do, you know, as an animator, um, you got to realize too, when we started, uh, when I started an animation, I interned, uh, in 1988 when I was, uh, that's when I was training, I was right at the end of Oliver and company and they were just starting production on the little mermaid. So animation really hadn't made its big resurgence yet. Hmm. So there was no such thing as, the Lion King and Beauty and the Beast and all these different things. It was a wide open slate. And so they, animation was going to go away. Uh, in 1984, Michael Eisner came in and he <clears throat> was taking over the company and they were trying to realign it and everything. And one of the kind of the big money sucks for the, for the company was, was animation because it, it just was, it was floundering and he wanted to shut it down. But it was Roy Disney that came along and said, you know, give it to me and let me turn it around. And so that's when they decided to kind of give it new life. And so they went out uh, in the, kind of the mid 80s, late 80s and started recruiting from different schools. And so the reason I'm telling you all of this is because by the time we all came in, we were recruited. We were all fresh out of college. Uh, we were 20, 21, 22 years old. Wow. Um, and we all were all of a sudden, you know, you had a crew let's say you have a crew of 300 people and about 65% of them are people in their twenties. And, uh, so we, st we were still kids in a, in a sense. Yeah. So, sure. you know, we were making these big blockbuster movies, but we'd also break into big, you know, rubber band fights and, you know, <laughs> food fights and, you know, it just, it was great. It was a big party. It was like, it was like an extension of college because I I was I, I went to the Ringling College of Art and Design in Sarasota, Florida. It was a three year school at the time, and I majored in illustration. And uh, my job actually started with Disney about a month before I graduated, so they let me leave early. So literally, I went from one week I was in my class working on projects to the next week I was sitting at a desk at Disney, wow. but surrounded by other another you know all other twenty year olds. So it was like we never left college. It's just the, the mm. classroom changed. And so um, it was a joy every single day. And for 15 years, we worked at that studio in Orlando. There was two campuses. There were two campuses. <laughs> there was two studios. There was one in Los Angeles and one in Orlando at MGM Studios. I guess it's Hollywood Studios now. Um, and we worked together on the features. Um and so uh, in Orlando, we all started as this young group and we grew together for 15 years and got married and had kids and we were this big family. And and uh, a lot of people say that about places that they work, but this is true. We we spent time together. We did vacations together. We, you know, it was amazing. It was just an incredible wow. time. And then, you know, there were times when we on every film there'd be you know those crunch periods for you know a few months where you didn't get to see your immediate family your wife your your husband your kids um you know i'd go into work on aladdin i remember i was going in at or in and lion king i was going and and mulan i was going in at 7 a.m and i wouldn't leave until 2 a.m you know i'd go wow. home and sleep for four hours and then and back into the studio and uh wow. uh 
and so and from that point of view, you know, it was a lot of, it was, you know, we were working very hard, but we also, you know, we had a lot of fun too. Can I ask whether, you know, you're doing that much work, you know, constant, you know, full days, just working all the time. Did it ever become a chore, you know, oh, your of passion for illustration? Yeah. I mean, it, it, yeah, there are times where it was just, you know, like when, when's it ever going to end? But I got to hand it to Disney. I can never say a bad word to Disney. I mean, they they really treated us wonderfully. They worked us hard, and um, they did. But they they uh, they fed us well. <laughs> they provided masseuses for when we were getting overworked. Um, oh wow, nice! Uh, they really did. So um, we're, we're, we're editing that bit cool. out. I don't want the team here getting ideas. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking, <laughs> and, yeah. and the, you know, and when we weren't working, when the when the crunch was over, they, Disney was great about providing enrichment programs for us. They, you know, every employee had a certain amount of money that they could spend and go out and go. You know, if I wanted to fly to, you know, someplace in Wyoming and chase deer and and learn about something or other, I could I could use this fund and and. Uh, you know bring it back to work oh that's great so, so like before um uh like the lion king and things like that did you guys then go on like off off site and and go into the wild and actually go and study the animal or how did that work i mean how did you become so yeah well i mean for obviously they couldn't do that for an entire crew of 400 people but yeah. the, the department heads the the you know the the directors the the composers the you know the producers that sort of thing they did go to africa they did they did safaris and all that and they uh, the art director and you know it was their job to kind of bring africa back to the rest of us yeah and uh but meanwhile we we brought animals into the studio you know we we went into the sound stages and we had lions brought in and, you know, we played with them, you know, the little ones anyway. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. For brother bear, when I was directing that, I took, you know, I went to Alaska twice and brought a crew with me. We went, uh, we went all over, we went Wyoming, Yellowstone, Alaska, all over Alaska. Uh, myself and uh, one of our story guys, he and I camped in the highest concentration of grizzly bears oh, in the wow. world. And we were, we were there for a week and, you know, we'd That's come out. That's amazing. It was great, oh. you know, because it's all mm. about, you know, fi- you know, the sights, the smells, the, the mm. experience. Um, you know, for anybody that's seen Brother Bear, when you see the transformation sequence, when Kenai, the main character, is transformed into a bear, that region where they're, they, they're you know, they're going through this foggy, ca- you know, maze of cliffs and caverns and all this that's a real place that we went to so wow. you know we we pull these experiences back and we put them into the film yeah have you ever been to south africa i've only i've been to kenya and tanzania oh okay so uh, never here okay yeah because i come from south africa so i, I, I want to go uh, africa the, the continent east africa so far east africa has been my favorite place uh in the world uh, out of any trip i've ever done and i can't wow, wait that's to, interesting yeah i just yeah. i'm always trying to get back there so yeah so uh i want to get i want to hit uh south africa and namibia as all as well yeah. you have to it's yeah. beautiful yeah. yeah you'll love it may i ask sure. um, i have two little daughters a four-year-old ella mm-hmm. and a two-year-old mia and they love disney movies they love the little mermaid uh they wa- i mean they have the outfits they yeah. wear it they're absolutely <laughs> in love with it and they also have you know love uh fro i mean anything disney really especially if it has princesses they're absolutely in love with and I've always wondered, how do you know before a movie comes out, how do you design a character where you know that uh, children will fall in love with it? Because my daughters just fall in love with these characters. And uh, do, do you know what I'm getting at? I don't know how I to do. Pre- precisely word we did, it. We, we do. Uh, keep in mind that, you know, we all have families as well. And so my kids grew up. My kid, my daughter, and my son are 27 and 28 now. And, uh, and I'm a grandfather. And so they, they grew up in the studio. And, um, but even before that, before we get to that, we're, we're designing, we're writing, uh, we're doing all of that to satisfy ourselves first. And, Hmm. um, and it's not, you know, it's interesting. It's 
we never we never try to make these films for a four year old or a five year old or an eight year old. We don't try to do that. We we always remember what our core audience is, is that eight to twelve year old audience. But we're really making these movies for ourselves, and um, you know, especially our story sessions. It's interesting. We we always called our story sessions our therapy sessions because you know we hit a lot of hard themes in there a lot of times, mm. and a lot of those themes come from places that we've experienced and survived on our own. And sometimes we'll break into tears, we'll get into fights, we'll, you know, all of that stuff, because it's coming from a real place. And that, that, that writing and that emotion makes its way into our visual designs as well. And so you try to, we try to design from, from an honesty, from a place of honesty. And, uh, um, and we pull from, you know, a lot of times I'm pulling from people I know, from experiences I've had, um, Nala, uh, when I designed Nala for the Lion King, um, my daughter had these big, beautiful, really cute eyes. And so I took her eyes and I put them on Nala. Oh, wow. That's, <laughs> that's a claim to fame so for her. Cool. Yeah. And it's funny. My daughter just walked in right before we started and uh, she's 28 and she still tells everybody she's Nala from the Lion King. <laughs> pretty funny. I, I, so I certainly cool. would. That's great. Yeah, yeah. me too. <laughs> but it really is. It's it's just it's just being honest with the designs and and uh, um, and you know, and just you know applying you know good design you know just from a, yeah. a straight academic standpoint you know just you know applying good design yeah. Can I ask when you were with a you know a, a large group of animators how do you keep a consistent style because obviously you know like if if us four all started you know, to produce something together, there would be, it would be hard for us to all- A mishmash. Con- yeah, it'd be a mishmash well, of styles. That, this podcast yeah. is probably a testament to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there's definitely, you know, yeah, there's, you know, there's 400, 350 to 400 different artists and technicians and that sort of thing that work on any given film. And obviously that's a lot of different minds. And so back in the day when we were doing hand-drawn stuff, yeah, I mean, there's uh, from from an animation standpoint, there is usually about thirty five to forty animators. You know, there's other artists and other disciplines, but um, so that's a lot of people to get to draw the same way. And so a lot of times, you know, in the early days of a film, we would sit with the art director sometimes, uh, with the directors, with whoever that had that style in their minds, and and we would talk about the style of the film. We'd get together and talk about the style of our of our characters. I know in Aladdin. Um, there was great caricature artist, Al Hirschfeld was the influence for the design of the film for Aladdin, both, you know, the environments and the characters. And so we, ha- we all studied Al Hirschfeld and that fluid style that he has. The genie mm. is a perfect example of Al Hirschfeld. Yeah. And so we all tried to, uh, to apply that to our, to our characters. You know, one of the stories I tell, you know, on Aladdin where, I designed Raja, which it was a small part. I was young and I had this first time I had a character and I'd studied tigers because I wanted to know how to animate tigers, but everything was hard and angular. And, and I didn't know how to find that fluidity of how Hirschfeld in those, in those uh, designs. And it wasn't until I was walking down the street one day and there was a, a car, a Jaguar car. And I saw the hood ornament. And it just mm-hmm. stopped me in my tracks. And that hood ornament really kind of gave me in the inspiration. And I blended it with some of my tiger designs. And boom, I had the design for the movie. So, wow. um, you know, it's it's all of us getting together and comparing notes and, um, and, you know, trying to pull inspiration from different places. And that's how we kind of, you know, we're constantly policing ourselves to make sure that we're, you know, not going outside the view of the film. Yeah. Amazing. Um, so I have a couple of questions from people on our team here at Design Cuts, actually, from Matt and SJ on our team. And sure. They were both kind of wondering about how things have evolved from that traditional medium um, into more of a CGI realm, I guess. And A, how you feel about that. Um, and if you feel like maybe it's lost some of its character in the process. And B, how you... Tr- perhaps try and keep some of that authenticity as the medium changes. I don't think it's lost authenticity, or at least not in the storytelling. And I and I and and, it's, and I'm talking about. I'm looking at companies like 
Disney and Pixar and DreamWorks to an extent. Um, the tools have changed, yes, but the if you look at the front end, you know you can take a movie and it, you can basically break up the making of a movie into three different parts. You're, you have your pre-production, or do, you have your development, then you have your pre-production, then you have production. It's those three stages that make a film. When you're looking at the development and pre-production, well, actually more of the development. When you're working, you're talking about the development, and that's that's the development of the story. That's the script writing. That's the coming up with the characters. Uh, you know some of the visuals that virtually has not changed one iota it just hasn't changed mm. at all the storytelling is still the most important part the storytelling is still where we put most of the weight um without a great story you don't have a film and so i always tell you know when i'm teaching story i always tell everybody when i start off it's the only element in filmmaking in making a film that literally can stand on its own Meaning I can sit here and I can tell you verbally mm. a story and I can take you on a journey. Whereas the other elements are all there just to support that one element, which is the story. So that's the most important part. And I really think that has not gone away. I think, you know, obviously sometimes we hit some, you know, there's some misses and there's some extreme wins. Uh, but I think that relatively, you know, I think the storytelling has stayed the same. Um, when you get into the production, the look, there's a there's an element to me that is sad that 2D has largely gone away in the feature world mm. in the United States. It's still fairly strong, I think, in the uh, in Europe. Um, but um, but on you know lower budget films. But in, as far as big budget, you know, mainstream films, uh, yeah, I'm sad to see that go away because you know I always. We always likened it to, you know, making a Rolls Royce by hand. You know, it's there's mm -hmm. there's this handmade quality to it. But I don't think that um, at least the really good CG films, I don't think they've lost any kind of soul. I just think they've gotten slick. And um, yeah, I, as a viewer, I would tend to agree for sure about the story. But I think um, yeah. a lot of the viewers would probably agree. Uh, with you when it came to the stylistic side of it it's almost that longing for nostalgia right yeah mm -hmm. and i yeah. think the older films certainly have that yeah mm -hmm. and yeah and that's it i think it's the nostalgia that people are looking at and i think they're confusing that with whether or not a film has soul because if you talk to kids that are post 2d you know some young kids you know mm. the, the all of a sudden the 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 frozen and uh, Coco and some of these new films that have come out recently, those are becoming the films that are defining their childhood. And so, and those films do have soul. I think they do. Yeah. I think the pencil was really fancy that they used to make those films. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, really fancy. But uh, yeah, it's just, you know, it's what we're going through and seeing the transition of, of mediums in our filmmaking is no different than what any generation has gone through, mm. through history. And uh, um, and we just long for the old days, I think, is is what the issue is. And I, yeah. um, you know, it's I, I personally I mean, I'm trying to embrace both. And I think there's a way to blend them. And I do think 2D is going to come back around in some form or another, maybe not to the degree that it was in the 90s and, and before that. But I do mm -hmm. think uh, we're in for some really cool, expressive ways of filmmaking that we haven't even thought of yet. Mm, I hope so. You know what I love? I, I love about the whole, especially about Disney. And I love hearing you talk about the story is the most important part. Yeah. Be because, uh, you know, as a fairly new father and just watching my children watch it, I'll see a perfect example is my oldest loves Lion King. And she'll yeah. watch it and then she started school and she will make parallels between the characters and, for instance, going to school and being afraid to go and see people. She literally can model her behavior on that and or and Sam won't be brave like <laughs> this person from this Disney That's so film. Uh, and it's just amazing because I think you're absolutely right. I mean, she watches other things and never says that, but the stories are so deep yeah. and so like a real thing that is an adult or a child you can relate to. Yeah. That it just means so much to them. Um hmm. it just I feels love, good, I, you know? Yeah, I love that you have and this is what blew my blew me away when I did my trip to Asia. Um that film's 25 years old, you know, and it's still affecting children that way. So that makes me really, really happy. 
it, yeah, it totally transcends the medium, I think. No one looks at those things and goes, oh, that's just a cartoon kind of thing. Exactly. Today. Yeah. It's yeah. like yeah. changed exactly. lives and yeah, generations. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I agree 100%. So that's why, you know, from an artistic standpoint, we can sit here and go, you know, it's not the medium and we should we should be making 2D films still and all that. But uh, it's hard to convince uh, an executive of that. <laughs> you know, that's, those are the issues that we were going through. You know, when, um, Aaron, uh, I wanted to ask you about your um, the legend of timber. Yeah. Um, did you? Has it ever been finished? Like- no. So what happened with the legend of Tembo was um, we got two year, two and a half years into making it. We were just about to start production, and Digital Domain, the parent company that we were working for, uh, went bankrupt, and mm-hmm. everything everything went under. Um, but we we have a wonderful test that's been animated from it that was animated. We had a whole bunch of environments, characters modeled. That was all the pre production, you know, that was getting done. Yeah. And the story itself, I it's one of the best stories that I've ever been a part of writing. I think. Um, wow. Aaron, was, just a thought. Um, sure. And stop me if I'm out of line here, or if you've tried this kind of thing. But sure. would it be suitable for a, a Kickstarter? Um, kind well, of thing where people really get behind it that way. Yeah. Well, um, first of all, it's it's not. It was bought out of um, it was bought out of uh, uh, bankruptcy. So what happened was there was a Chinese company called Galloping Horse that had uh, invested ten million dollars into digital domain when we were making that, and five million of that went directly into our our production costs, and five million went into the rest of the company. Uh, Digital Domain was also a visual effects company, and so they had the visual effects side of things going while we were also making our films, and mm-hmm. uh, and things just got spread too thin. So when the company went bankrupt, um, Galloping Horse, who was you know, they wanted to get their IPO and go public on the Asian market, they um, they didn't want to have any black eyes on their books, and so they came in and they bought not only Digital Domain, but they bought the uh, the movie itself out of bankruptcy Uh, so that they would have an asset on their books for that 10 million that they invested. So, uh, it's not ours anymore. It's, uh, it's in Beijing. Uh, but supposedly galloping horse has been sold and it's, or getting sold. And there's some stuff that we're working on right now. So it's still, you know, there might be a little bit of life that we can CPR into it. (laughs) So I, do think it's important cool. um 100% for the listeners as well it's so inspiring to hear about your journey and and you know your quite illustrious career and, and what you're doing now and and all of the passion behind it but of course life isn't all rosy and so yeah. i think perhaps on that note that that's maybe an example of that production and, and tradition studios um in so, in terms of something that didn't quite work out um do you mind maybe touching on you know how that how that was in the moment how that felt and and what kind of well i can actually let me let me let me take you back even further because it it was a an even tougher journey than you guys might realize um so i was at disney for 21 years i thought that was going to be my lifelong career and uh you know the first blow that we took was after that first 15 years um when you know i was telling you we had that studio we all grew together Disney decided after we did Brother Bear that they wanted to downsize and they shut that studio down. Wow. And so, um, and I mean, in just a day and, and we went from everybody was employed. There was 400 people working there to everybody was laid off except about 10 of us. And I was oh one of the gosh. ones that was held on to. Wow. So all my friends, scary. all my companions, all the, you know, all these people that we had grown up with, um, they were sent, you know, adrift on the wind, you know, and, and, uh, that was a tough one. And I'm a Florida boy. It was really nice to be, I was, I've grown up in Florida. It was nice to have my career here. And then, you know, in that moment I had to pack everything up, my wife and I, uh, and our two kids, and we had to move to California, move to Los Angeles. And so once we got over that, we went to Los Angeles and started working there. It was, it was just a whole series of events that happened. And, um, and once we got to California, I started developing a film called The King of the Elves. Uh, it was a big fantasy piece. It was a story. Uh, it was based on a story by Philip K. Dick, the science fiction writer that wrote Blade Runner and Minority Report and Total Recall. And he wrote this little 12 page short story that was fantasy. It was a really cool story. And, and we were about a year into developing it when my wife uh, Karen, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And so 
we kept, you know, kept working. We were trying to find, we were working on getting her cured and, uh, but we were having trouble. She was, it was just, it was very aggressive. And we got to the point where we were, uh, we, I couldn't work, I couldn't go to work anymore. I had to, uh, work from my home. And so the guys would come in and they'd come and they'd come to my house and that way I could take care of Karen and, and, uh, feed her and make sure everything would change her IVs and all the stuff we were going through, but also try to make a movie. It was, it was incredibly stressful. Um, and it just got worse and worse. And, uh, until on March 11th of 2007, um, you know, I was laying with her and she passed away in my arms. And so here I had, you know, my, my 20 year, you know, partner and she, and she, she died and my family, my, my kids were crushed. Everybody was crushed. And so here I had to go back. And after about a couple of weeks, I had to go back and make a movie. And so when I went back to Disney, it just wasn't there. And I tried for about a year to make things work. And finally, uh, it was John Lasseter and Ed Catmull brought me into their office and, and they were going to pull me off the film. And I knew in that moment that I had to make a change. I, <clears throat> I always told everybody, I always talk about this idea of persistence. If you just persist, you got to keep driving uh, this persistent vision. You have this vision of what you want to be and you drive forward. And uh, and it was in that period of my life that I lost that persistence. I lost that vision. And so I realized yeah. when they sat me down that I needed to find it again. I needed to reinvent myself. There were two things that identified who I was. It was my family where half of my family had passed away. My, my, my half of my soul had left. And then the other thing that really identified me was what I did for a living, my job with Disney, and that was crumbling. And so I, I knew in that moment when I sat down with them that I needed to make a decision. And so um, 21 years, and I just sat there and I said, I quit. And, uh, and But it wasn't a negative, qu I quit. It wasn't an angry, I quit. I just said, you know what, mm. I quit, you guys. I need to, I need to find my kids. I need to find me. And, uh, and they got it and we got up, we hugged it out and we cried and all that stuff. Mm. And, uh, and it was interesting because I went back the next day to clean out my office and, um, and I found that email from digital domain. They were looking for a director back in Florida of all places. And it was just <laughs> amazing how the universe lined up in that mm. one moment. But then I went back and, you know, we worked for that two years on digital domain at digital domain. And that, that went bankrupt and we lost that project again. And, and it was in, it was almost like, you know, whether it's God or the universe or whatever you believe in, at that point, it's, it's been pushing me to do this thing that I'm doing now. And uh, I'm not very religious, but I do think that there's, you know, maybe we're not in control sometimes, you know. And uh, and so it was interesting because after that went under, I decided, you know, what, I don't want to go back to the corporate world. Um, I'd suffered enough loss after when I lost Tembo that it really it didn't affect me as badly as it affected other people. Um, I just, I, I'd already gone through the hardest thing I could go through and I knew everything would be okay. So, um, and so I sat there for a while and I remember sitting on my, my back porch drinking a coffee and I started thinking about Glenn Keane, that guy so many years ago that taught me animation and how he shared. And I thought, you know what? We live in a, in a time of information you know, there's never been a better time to share information, to be an artist, to be a musician, to, to do, to share. And so I thought, you know what, I want to do something that would make my wife proud. And I want to do the same thing that Glenn did for me. And so that became the inspiration behind what we do now. And the irony is, is that I'm happier now creatively. Um, and just with what I'm doing, I'm happier than I've ever been in my entire career but the irony is that it took the death of my soulmate, my wife, to send mm. me in a direction that's ultimately brought me here. This is part of this big talk that I give to <laughs> to, to kids. But it, it's to me, it's a, it was a, you know, I'm 50 years old and I'm still learning and and from you know this this life lesson. It was a huge, uh, it was a huge lesson for me, you know, to the, just to keep pushing through all of that stuff and how even the most tragic things in your life can send you in directions that create incredible happiness. So. Yeah, that's a long, it's a long winded answer for, for your question, right. but, but uh, yeah, I just kind of, there was a lot to it. Yeah. First of all, thank you for um, just yeah. your, your openness and your honesty. Um, oh, sure. Mm. I, I, I just, I have to tell you this, Aaron, um, when I read your about page on your website, I could just 
I actually got quite emotional reading it because um, <laughs> I, I I could just feel I could feel all the things that you just you just spoke about and, yeah. and now it all makes sense why I could feel that because it just comes through yeah and um I have to say you are a complete and utter natural teacher because because that was going to be my next question like did you is this something like you've always wanted to do did you know you wanted to do it or was it just now because of what you just explained it just kind of happened it just it's, um it, i I've, i don't know that it's something i've always wanted to do but i've in, in the time in the opportunities that i've had in the past to teach i've enjoyed it and i do think i have a fairly good ability to take to articulate what i'm thinking to articulate you know, in a, in a understanding that's something I've always been able to do. And so I think that's helped a lot, um, uh, to be, <laughs> and sometimes I, you know, sometimes it's a struggle when you're trying to draw and demonstrate and, and, yeah, and talk at the same time, but, uh, yeah. you know, I, I'm a big believer in showing and not, not speaking as much, but I, you know, I do try to articulate as much as I can, but it, it is something that it's definitely evolved in me, but I've always, I've always enjoyed it. And, um, and I've always, like I said, I always go back to, I, I always, I, I talk about Glenn Keane a lot cause he's always been an ins inspiration for me. And he's a guy that had an incredible ability to impart, not just knowledge to teach, but he would impart this inspiration. He could inspire in ways that just, you know, if we would burst out of the, out of the auditorium, wanting to get back to our desk to, to draw every time he gave a lecture because he would just inspire us so much. And so I wanted to be that guy. I wanted to be the guy that did that, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I can tell you just, sorry, just quickly, you're having taken a few of your courses now and you, you, you do have that. It's like you, you are oh, a natural. Well, for thank sure. you. That means a lot to yeah. me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks. Talking about family, how much uh, of an influence were your parents in what you were doing? It's interesting. Both my parents are artists. Um, uh, my father is a musician. I had a very interesting gr uh, family growing up. Um, uh, my parents split when I was very young. I'm I'm one of nine kids by wow. four four different what? mothers <laughs> i can't imagine that <laughs> there's nine kids and four four different mothers That's so pra practically a sports team aaron exactly yeah. <laughs> well but it's not just that we didn't grow up under one roof my father who he's a great guy my father lives with me actually right now and uh but he was a musician he was on ed sullivan's show and you know he did all kinds of stuff he was rock and roll musician and and uh, he kind of kind of spread his seed, you know, and so uh, for lack of a better way of putting it, sorry. But um, uh, so there's a lot of us out there and we always we always joke that there's nine of us that we know of. So <laughs> but uh, he's but, next door right now being like, I can hear you, Aaron. Like, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. but it was interesting because my 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 parents were always very supportive of of the arts. My father, not only is he a great musician, uh, but he draws as well. And uh, so he was always encouraging me. My mother, I grew up with my mother and my stepfather. My stepfather was a designer. Um uh, my mother and I battled a lot. There was, there were a lot of issues, uh, you know, growing up, but I, through all of that, uh, she was an artist as well. And, you know, from a genetic standpoint, I got a lot of, a lot of it from her as well. And so, um, so as far as having that genetic head start, I think I, I was pretty well off, but then also I remember, you know, being five years old and my family always telling me, you know, my parents saying, you're, you're going to be an artist when you grow up. And there was never any question. There was never anybody that said, you're wasting your time. You got to be a doctor or anything like that. There was, it was always, you know, do what makes you happy and, and just, you know, pursue it. So what would you, what would you give as advice to someone who maybe doesn't have that supportive edge or has that, you know, positive, you know, you've got that talent to do it. You know, if they they have a passion, but they don't really have the backing of those around them or. Um... You know, I think at, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you have the backing of those around you, because there's been times that I didn't have the backing as well. Um, it really does come down to your heart and soul. What is it that makes you happy? Um, but what is it that makes you drive forward, too? I mean, I have a I get a question. I get this question a lot from students where they're in college and they say, yeah, I want to be an artist, but you know, what do you do when you, um, you know, right now I'm, 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 I'm going through a lack of enthusiasm. 
And I'd say, <laughs> well, you know what? <laughs> if you're lacking the enthusiasm, if you don't feel like doing it, yeah, there's times where I, you know, I draw less than, than normal, but you might not love it as much as you should. You know, yeah. and so if the, first of all, so what I'm getting at, if it's, it's got to be something that burns in you. I really do believe that, um, mm-hmm. to, especially if you if you're going to be successful as an artist, if it doesn't burn in you, you're not going to be successful because it's difficult. It really is. And um, and you really have to. Uh, there's a lot of people that that want to be artists and want to make that living as an artist. And and uh, not everyone can do it. And so it, it's going to take the ones that really are driven um, and really look at it as not just a means of expression and, and create, you know, it's through creating art, but you also, if you're going to make a living at it, obviously you have to look at it as a business too. And you have to have that business, business savvy. And, um, uh, you know, the, the dollars don't just magically appear. You have to, you have to make it happen. But at the same time, you know, one of the things, and my stepfather always said, he says, don't pursue the dollar. The, the dollar will present itself. And, uh, and I believe that as well, but you have to be ready when it does. <laughs> so, yeah, you know. it, it, is there perhaps anything else um, on that front? Because I, I've talked to so many people myself. We even have people with us on our team where they've come to work for us because they perhaps recognize the starving artist mentality. And so they at least wanted to work within a very creative company. Right. Because they thought, well, if I'm going to try and sell my sculptures or my paintings or whatever it might be, right. that is simply not going to be financially viable. So even if they're super passionate and driven and talented, as you say, there's millions of artists out there trying to do this. I think a lot of people will be like, wow, like how did you kind of fall into a, a job at Disney straight out of college? That's the dream. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's incredible. Um, what what other advice would you perhaps you know give to these college students and aspiring young people? Well, yeah, I mean, you, you kind of brought up Disney. I, I'm, I kind of am a little bit a bad one to, to talk because I, I, I do believe in timing as well. And the timing couldn't have been any more perfect in my life and career. Um, but if you truly have great ability, if you truly have worked hard and you're creating images that other people want to see, um, one of the greatest avenues that I've learned and I'm still learning is just the advent of social media right now. Social media is such a huge, huge tool. There's never been a better time saying it again. There's never been a better time to be an artist or musician. You know, the ability to get out there and share your work and create a following, which then translates into a demand um, is there's never been a better time. All it takes is hard work and pushing yourself to get yourself seen. You know, social media has become a huge part of what we do, um, and it comes back uh, in spades for us. I mean, it really comes back, and and uh, you know, if more more eyes that are seeing us, the more eyes want to investigate us. And I think that's, you know, one of the things for that any fine artist or any illustrator should be doing right now is you know, obviously that social media. Hundred percent. I get the feeling that. Uh... And a lot of the stuff you do, you're kind of guided by um, just like your your heart, I guess, or or what you feel is like just like your 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 heart is, I guess, a good place, a good way to say it. But yeah. when you you did mention social media, I'm curious, do you have any um, strategies or certain ways that you found work for you, or do you find that you just share what what you feel like sharing without thinking too much about it? Um. Yes and yes. <laughs> so, um, I there are I by doing it a lot, you see what where people react and where they don't react. So there are certain sub there's subject matter that I know is going to hit harder than other things. Um, I I work as much as I can, so I'm creating enough work that I have the ability to hit something that might be a flop. Um, but it's. I think the big, the, the, the best strategy is just consistency. And if you look at, look at my Instagram account, for instance, if you scroll through that, that thing, it's, it's so schizophrenic. You know, I just, you know, two days ago, I designed this big, crazy, weird looking dragon alien for this demo <laughs> that I was doing. Yeah, I saw and that. then, <laughs> yeah, and then yesterday I did a big fluffy pink kitten. 
So, I mean, it's just <laughs> the, the work is all over the place. And the ability to jump back and forth between illustration, painting, uh, and animation, that helps as well. So, yeah, you know, I guess maybe people resonate with what's at the core of that. So yeah. it's not so much a pre-thought out strategy, but they, they resonate obviously with the talent, but also the intent and the passion behind it. And mm. just the authenticity of putting your true self and your work out there. Yeah, I've really learned, uh, <laughs> and it sounds corny, but just be a nice guy. You know, that part of it, as far as put, trying to put, so true. Trying to put yeah. a personality out there, um, mm. just be nice and be encouraging. Yeah. And, you know, so many people hold on to any knowledge that they have. And I'm a big believer, yeah. in, you know, just let it go. And um, people appreciate that and they come they, they and they they flock to you for it. So that I like. Yeah, I, I think you're a pretty perfect example of that, that openness and that sharing, actually. So for every person listening, I swear that is something we all go through, especially when we're younger. And I, yeah. I remember like 10 years ago, being in the same mindset of like, I can't give any of that away. What if other people copy <laughs> it and stuff? And it doesn't work like that. It really doesn't. Yeah. Think of it as like that, that piece of information is a hammer. That's all it is. It's a tool. It doesn't mean that person knows how to swing the hammer. You know, it still takes practice to swing a hammer and hit the nail on the head. Yeah. So, you know, you just get it out there and, and let people practice with it. Okay. I have a question re related to illustration. Sure. Um, it's kind of like those questions that those stupid questions that you get asked. If your house is burning down, what would, <laughs> what's, if you could only take one thing? <laughs> yeah, I okay. love those questions. So, <laughs> um, if there was one skill or knowledge or point of view or whatever that you think that an artist should have, what would it be? Okay. Once again, sounding corny, and I've, I've already kind of alluded to this. But I think more than anything else, an artist should have persistence. And I talk about this a lot. Uh, but, you know, it, that it goes down to, you know, what's more important, talent or hard work. Once again, I think it's persistence. It's the persistence that will uh, that will outweigh any kind of talent. A talented, yeah, lazy true. person is gonna, never going to evolve. But, you know, a persistent you know, hardworking person that supposedly does not have quote talent will always outshine. Um, mm. That persistence will get you through dark times. That persistence will get you through lean times. Um, so to me, the things that the thing that one thing has always paid off in my life is is that persistent need or want to create even through the darkest times of my life. Mm. You know, when when my wife wasn't next to me anymore eventually that persistence of wanting to create still came back and eventually i started creating again so mm -hmm. it's through persistence that you achieve whatever goal so it's 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 that bullheaded i'm gonna do this i can do it i can do it through yeah through failure through setbacks through anything i think I like i'm gonna that. isolate the audio mm. from uh what you just said and just kind of have it there in my pocket if i need a little jolt yeah. of motivation. <laughs> Or exactly. to all the listeners who are out there doing this daily challenge and yeah. struggling yeah. to stick to it, go go and isolate that audio and play it back. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I would love to ask a, something that just occurred to me. Um, so, so many people, their dream is to work for Disney. Their dream, everything you're describing and everything that I've read about you is probably in so many people's list of goals and things that they dream of doing in their life. Right. As someone who's done those things, um, I feel like some people feel so uh, unsatisfied or they feel like I'll be happy when I get that done or when I finally work at Disney or if I finally get to do this. As someone yeah. that's done that, do you find that when you hit those things, you said, oh, wow, now I'm happy? Or did you find that uh, that doesn't come from that? I know that's kind of a very philosoph uh, philosophical or big question, but... Um, I'm a big believer now, especially nowadays, this is where my, my grumpy old man comes out. I'm a big believer <laughs> in that, in a, that uh, with the age of information that we have, um, the dark side of that is, is that instant accessibility. We live in the American idol generation. 
I can't. I, first of all, I like watching the, those shows. That's one of my guilty pleasures of, is watching like American Idol and that sort of thing. But one of the things I hate hearing is, you know, you have this 18 year old kid that's trying to make it on American Idol. And, and they're, the, they say, you know, this is it. I've been working my whole life. And if I don't make it, this is it. <laughs> I know. You know? Um, and there's so many kids that, uh, and I say kids because I'm 50, but there's so many kids and that kids means up to age 30 that, um, that have that mentality. And, uh, and it's, you know what? Disney, Disney was great. Um, Disney was amazing. Um, but I wasn't happy all of the time. Um, and I can go back to once again, back to that tragic story. I was at Disney when my life, when my wife passed and it didn't, there was no fulfillment there. The only times I've ever felt fulfilled is when, you know, my family is together. My, my, my friends are working. It's, it's all, it's all the things that make you who you are. Um, the external things really don't matter. And you can, you can find happiness, uh, you know, no matter what you're doing. And, you know, my father is, my father always used to say, Hey, if you're happy digging a ditch, then dig ditches. <laughs> but, um, but you know what? <sighs> I, I, there's many kids like what you just asked that I, obviously that I've met that want to work for Disney thousands and, um, but not all of them are going to make it. And so I, I try very hard to let them know that, you know, Disney is a great goal, but it doesn't have to be the goal. That's that that's going to make you happy. That's not, that, that shouldn't be the thing that's going to make you happy. The journey is what, you know, she, and I, I'm going to sound like a, a bunch of cliches coming out of my mouth, but I've, you know, I, I believe in them. It, it really is the journey that has to make you happy. And uh, if you can surround yourself with good people and good friends, good family, that sort of thing, um, and you're creating, then that's, that to me is where the joy is, you know, yeah. your life, your life, when you look back on it, it's, it's, you never see it as a string. You see it as a series of moments. And, uh, when you, when you remember, and, you know, I remember great moments at Disney, but I also remember great moments more often, you know, in those times when I was sitting, you know, having a beer with a friend or whatever it might be. And so those are the, those are the things that you need to strive for. And, and yeah, Disney can be a nice goal, but, you know, to be blunt, the odds are because of just playing sheer numbers, you won't make it. So what are some other things that you might want to do that can make you happy? Um, you know, don't, don't set that site as the one thing that will make you happy because you're setting yourself up for disappointment. This might sound like a really weird comment, Aaron, but I keep getting really lost in what you're saying to the point I forget I'm on a live call with you and we're interviewing you and I feel like I'm watching a video and I'm just like kind of nodding along and then I'm like, oh wait, I need That's to talk really good. <laughs> I don't know if the rest it's of you so guys true. are getting that. I hope you have to good. Let me just yeah. stop. It's like, let me stop the video and write that down. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. Uh, oh, I love goodness. it. Nice. So, um, I, I mean, shall we maybe end on like a super quick fire round? We're not very good at doing quick fire as a as a group. But, <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, um, no have, have we got any like super super quick random questions to wrap up sure. on? Sure, they're not random. Note, maybe. Mine, mine's more. Yes, I've got one. Oh. Go, you go. Yeah. yeah, I've got one as uh, well. Okay, mine's more practical. Actually, uh, I'm just thinking because uh, I get so many questions about uh, equipment and stuff. But what is your main? uh equipment workflow what is what are the tools just a quick overview of the tools you use the programs you use on a sort of daily basis my most important uh my most important tool two things one is sketchbook and pen sketchbook and pen cintiq and photoshop those are my if, if i had to strip everything away it would be my cintiq and photoshop and my sketchbook and pens do you have an apple do you have an apple ipad Probably. I do, but I don't. It's funny. I don't use it very often. I bought the iPad and I, I downloaded Procreate so that when I go, when I'm on the go, when I'm not in my office, I can use my iPad. But it's I can't. I have a. I'm re having a really hard time breaking the habit of just using my sketchbook. So mm -hmm. when I when I get away from my big oh, Cintiq, nice. I go back to drawing traditionally. I just can't break that habit. I like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> good. 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 Um. So, so my random quick fire question. Uh, would be out of everything you've done, whether 
it's your own movies or or it's a Disney film or if it's just a random image on your Instagram, have you got one or two favorite characters that you've done that spring to mind? Oh wow, that's it's like a good picking one. your favorite child, right? It's probably yeah. No, as question. far as as far as drawing some paintings, I uh, you know I really don't fall in love with them as much as uh, people have, have asked. You know, I that, that think I fall in love. I don't. I I love creating images and I move on to the next stuff. But as far as characters go, because you know in animation when you create a character and you live with that character, that it does become like a child. It becomes something real to you. Um, you know. I really fell in love, even though it wasn't my own character. I loved make, uh, animating the Beast. The Beast was one of my favorite characters to have ever. It, it, it was just he was an amazing dimensional character that became real to me. Cool. Um, and I think know, he stands out in people's memories much the same way definitely. as the genie in Aladdin. He's, yeah. he's one that people often cite as a, a real standout Disney character. Yeah. One of the first sequences I ever animated in a movie was, it was a sequence that Glenn Keane gave to me to do. And it's a sequence in Beauty and the Beast where um, he's been injured and they're sitting in front of the fireplace and Belle is trying to bandage his arm and they get into this big argument, you know, that hurt. And they, they Mm -hmm. start yelling back and forth. And by, but by the end of it, she thanks him for saving his life. And he, you know, all of a sudden softens and turns and, um, that's probably my favorite scene as well from my favorite character to my favorite scene uh because of you know the amount of the depth of emotion that was in that sequence and Mm. and how he softened at the end for the very first time in the film um and also you know how me being a young kid when i was when i animated it how it kind of set my career going after that so that was pretty cool i'm gonna have to binge watch them again this weekend yeah (laughs) exactly <laughs> how about the rest of you guys yeah Question? i have one um do you do you get still get nervous at all did you ever get nervous teaching like if you're standing up in front of a group um i do, does, do you I do. do you okay yeah. i'm glad to hear that Actually, i mean i know this sounds nasty well, you know but funny, I, mean... <laughs> I got the my the most nervous i got on this last trip when i was in asia i walked into the room and i had to give a one-hour lecture to 120 four five and six year olds <laughs> and i about died they can be lethal they can that's what i'm gonna <laughs> say <laughs> tough audience yeah <laughs> i was so <laughs> nervous uh and it was funny because i started to talk about what i do and i was losing them a little bit and uh i started drawing and they were going to draw with me so they're they're drawing with me but then they're there. I could hear them just going nuts. And so I was like, oh, I'm losing. Them. I got to draw faster. So I'm drawing faster. And now they're going crazy. And it didn't matter how fast <laughs> I drew. They were going nuts. And then someone said, slow down. You're drawing too fast. They can't keep up. <laughs> it was funny. So then I slowed it down. Then they all came back down, down to me again. So it was oh, funny. Shit. But yeah, I still get nervous very much so. Yeah. Okay, good. So you're human. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm always, <laughs> Glenn Keane says this too. I'm always afraid that people are going to finally see through me and see it's all a sham. But I really, I really can't do it. <laughs> yeah. Do you ever have imposter syndrome? Oh, yeah. Have ever had imposter syndrome? Yeah. Like it, it's not, like it's not really me. Like I can't really do oh, yeah. this. Is that what you mean? Yeah. 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 All the time. <laughs> yep all the time Good to know. this is why we're the honest designers we get the stuff out exactly of people. Yeah. <laughs> dustin how about you to yes out? i have a undesign related question so sure what is something that you feel like you couldn't live without in your life it could be a book or an object or a something but that's not design related that you love music and it's any music. I, I I play a lot of music. So I've got, if you guys could see right over here, I've got about 10 guitars hanging up on my wall. So I love the ability to just walk in and pick up a guitar and start playing. So uh, yeah, definitely my music playing. Cause uh, if I can't, if I can't draw and express myself that way, then I like to play music. Do you have a favorite guitar nice. that you own? I do. I've got a, a, a national resonator. That I Ooh. do a lot of slide and Delta style blues on and that sort of thing. That's my favorite. So that's my favorite guitar. Very cool. Nice. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Dustin also plays guitar well, and I play it 
very badly. Um, no, but we play really well, we're, we're getting into a pattern here, I think, of having awesome guests on who are also guitarists. We had uh, yeah. a fellow Aaron, Aaron Draplin on, and he was jamming on the guitar as well. So maybe it's a, it's a link with uh, creativity, <laughs> perhaps. I think it is. I think it is. When we were at Disney that yeah, yeah uh, every Christmas we we put together a band, and we we had about twelve people in the band. It was great. That's cool. Oh, That's I'd pay to cool. see that. Yeah. yeah, it was yeah. awesome. We had horns. We had we had the whole deal. Backup singers. <laughs> yeah, it was great. That is so cool. So, Aaron, just um, just on a final note, where can people find you? And if they if they want to get in touch or or learn from you or or right. just get involved in what you're building, where's the best place for that? Uh, my website is creatureartteacher.com. It's uh, the art of Aaron Blaze. And uh, there's all kinds of stuff there from, you know, Photoshop brushes that I create to all kinds of lessons and, and whatnot. Um, all of my social media is whatever the social media is and Aaron Blaze Art. So uh, uh, you, I think YouTube is Aaron Blaze Art. Instagram is Aaron Blaze Art. So um, Facebook is Aaron Blaze Art. Uh, and I've you my YouTube channel probably is the second greatest resource for finding information and it's all for free. Mm. So um, yeah. I, I have a whole series of videos on there called Aaron's Art Tips that I've been doing for about four years. And uh, there's several hundred videos in there or a couple hundred videos um, yeah, where amazing. I just give sometimes it might be a five minute tip and sometimes it might be a full hour long video. But um, there's all kinds of information in there as well. Well, you got massive following on, uh, yeah. you, know, you know, subscriber base on on YouTube. Yeah, I, th I think you do on yeah. every platform. I'm yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We've we've been we've been working hard trying to build that up. Yeah, so it's it's finally it's finally been paying off. Well, so. Aaron, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Mm, and uh, yes. on a personal note, if you're ever in London, um, you know, we'd love for you to visit and certainly take you out for beers, dinner. Whatever we're hoping like, uh, we're hoping to be there in the next within the next year so we definitely want cool. to do it yeah yeah, yeah. Hit, hit, hit me up if you're uk side we will for we'll, sure we'll look after yeah. you. but thank you so much i i love that episode to be honest i think that was thank a lot you of, i've, a lot I've of really insight. enjoyed it thank you for uh, allowing me to spill my guts and talk to you guys <laughs> no, we really appreciate it thanks we for, like thanks you for guts. Stopping yeah. by. <laughs> 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 all right thank you thanks so much for listening to this week's episode we hope that you enjoyed hearing Aaron's amazing story and are now feeling inspired to tackle whatever creative challenges and opportunities come your way. As always, you can find full show notes for this episode over at honestdesigners.com or find us over on iTunes by searching for The Honest Designers Show. If today's episode helped you, then it would mean so much to us if you took just a moment to leave us a quick review on iTunes, as this is one of the best ways for other designers to discover the show. Thanks again for tuning in and we will see you next week right here on The Honest Designers Show.